conceptual people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements Everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Hope everybody is ready to get that week off to a great start. As for me, it started on yesterday. I normally uh, try to set things in motion for my week on Sunday. And so this is just a continuation for me. But I'm hoping that you're getting yourself off to a great start. Look, before I touch on what it is I want to talk to you briefly about, because I'm going to come back with a guest uh, this afternoon and actually talk about it more in depth a colleague and a friend Dr. Michael Blanchard we're going to talk about the whole uh, Ice Cube uh, Trump thing uh, where we stand on it what we see uh, some of the things that I predicted more than five years ago we're going to talk about all of that stuff uh, this evening 3.30 Central Time uh, we're going to try to run a live we're going to get all that set up so that we can do that on the other hand, um, don't forget to support the work that we're doing. Uh, the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative, uh, my wife's passion, Restoring Ghettos Forgotten Daughters. Go to her channel, Restoring uh, Ghettos Forgotten. Uh, she's decided to expand it beyond simply reaching out to our ladies. So men, you can actually go over there and hear some pretty powerful stuff, get some insight. Uh, we're connecting, we're sharing, we're doing things. I've been, uh, integrated her into my podcast platform uh, from the desk of Rick Wallace, which I'll probably change uh, as well. Uh, may make it a part of the Black Voice franchise, which is on Facebook and YouTube. I uh, might take it to the podcast as, as well. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, encourage you to show some love and support. Uh, the way that you can support us is always going to be indicated in the first paragraph of any video on this YouTube channel. Uh, and any description box of any other platform on which uh, this video or audio of this video is posted. Um, now, I want to go ahead and get into the preliminary discussion of where I personally stand. Uh, and I speak specifically for myself uh, and I know that a bunch of others who are boots on the ground truly engaged share my sentiments and so um, this won't be extremely long but I want to talk about it um, sometime last week it was reported uh, in an inaccurate depiction of what really happened that Ice Cube had joined forces with Donald Trump and was working with Donald Trump to um, put together some plan when actually the truth was Ice Cube contacted both Republicans and Democrats, uh, the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign and said, hey, this is the contract that I have uh, for the black community. Now, a lot of people saying nobody elected Ice Cube uh, to be the representative of black people. And that's true. Uh, I've always said that I'm not big on celebrities taking leadership roles and activist roles in something that they don't commit to and they're not related to. I'm not big on uh, looking to celebrities to set the standard. I'm more about those who are truly engaged, boots on the ground, engaged, have their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in our community, have the knowledge and the background to talk about the psychology of generational trauma, the psychology of oppression, uh, to talk about the economic impact of uh, this white racial caste system to talk about the social impact, the academic impact, those of us who have put the time and the energy and the effort in to understand and to know and to learn, uh, those people are the people that I believe we should be looking at. But when someone comes and they've taken the time to do what others will not do, and they bring it to the forefront and they use their bully pulpit as a celebrity and as someone who has amassed a certain amount of wealth, to actually make a point, then I sit up and say, okay, let's see what you're talking about. How far are you willing to go with this? What are you willing to do with it? And so I told Dr. Blanchard, who is going to be on uh, this evening, this afternoon, I told him roughly about five years ago that during a conversation 
that facts have absolutely no meaning whatsoever to the conditioned mind. And what I mean by that is once you've been conditioned to believe something and see something a certain way, you can be presented with facts and you will find a reason and a way to dismiss the facts. Why? Because the facts that oppose your way of thinking create this thing called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the discomfort you feel when you are forced to engage conflicting realities or truths. When you hold a position on something and you are forced to look at something that is diametrically opposed to it by way of fact and presentation, and that discomfort will cause you to find a way to dismiss it, to bring back the comfort, the psychological and emotional comfort you feel within the belief system. You have two choices when you are, for, when you are dealing with cognitive dissonance, and everybody deals with it. You have two choices. You can find a way to dismiss the facts or you can embrace truth and come to an understanding and a knowledge that over time you're going to consistently be forced to reevaluate your positions on life as you grow. As you grow, new information comes in. As you grow, new way of thinking, new ways of thinking emerge. And you don't see things the same way. And you have to be open to that. A person who is unwilling to accept new facts, new ideas, new thoughts isn't a person that's growing. It's a person that's stagnant. It's a person that's stuck. And we have a bunch of people who are stuck because they've been conditioned to hold a position without proof, without verification, without validation, solely based on that's what they were given. That's what they were told. That's what has always been. And we get locked into that. And then we go on the assaultive to protect that position rather than stopping to look and ask questions. We don't ask enough questions. We don't do enough research. We don't do enough reading. And so the first thing that I learned when I heard this, when it first hit and everybody was losing their mind, okay, go find out what's going on. I know for a fact that Ice Cube had been pushing uh, a certain narrative about holding people accountable. He had been going in and saying some things. So I knew that there were certain people that were not going to be open to working with him because he was being very, very frank and upfront and saying, hey, look, this is what's going on. So basically, from what I've been able to gather in my research is he basically went to both parties and said, said, hey, look, to the Trump administration, to the Biden campaign, here's my contract with black America. Let's sit down and talk about how close we can get to it. That's the place you start. And this idea that you can do it would it would have been okay for him to do it with the Dems, but because he's doing it with Trump, it's a problem, shows that we still have not developed a lucid perspicacity of political science. We're still playing the emotional game of who we like. Pol politics isn't about who you like. Politics is about who you can get something from. That's what politics is in every situation. It's about knowing how to communicate, how to work between the relationships in any given environment. Politics don't just exist in the government. Politics exist in the workforce. Politics exist in the home. Politics exist in any relationship where there are more than two people. It's how you build and work relationships to accomplish something. Well, if you're not accomplishing anything, then you are not truly influential within the party or the political structure and so blacks have not been influential in the political structure and so we have to say why because we think that we can just get someone else and say we're going to ride with you no matter what and then we're going to trust you to do right by us the problem is there are other people that's going to that same group and saying, this is what we're going to do for you. But in order for us to do this, you're going to have to do this, this, and this, and this for us. And if you do that, then we'll get with you. And see, those people actually have more leverage because they have more people. And so they need those votes. Well, here you are over here. You're already giving them your vote. You're not demanding anything. Look, we don't trust them other people. You told us they were racist. So we're going with you no matter what. Well, guess what? I've got you in my pocket now. I don't have to give you anything. Here's the biggest problem. It's not just that you gave it away for nothing. It's that the people that are demanding something for their vote, a lot of their interests are in conflict with yours. So when they make their demands to this particular group that you're giving your vote to, 
they have to meet those demands to get that vote or they won't get it next time. They will vote against your interest and they have no problem doing it. Why? Because they know you're going to come right back. Look, since the 19, early 1960s, black voter turnout has increased during every presidential election cycle up until 2016, where for the first time in si almost 60 years, it dropped. Now, in that increase in voter turnout, this one thing has remained steady. 90% of that vote, as it has increased in voter turnout, has gone religiously to the Democratic Party. Yet there has been no promise or delivery of anything tangible from the Democratic Party in 60 years. Am I saying that that means we go Republican? Absolutely not. Jumping from one side to the other side is not the answer. The answer is saying, okay, there are going to be people on both sides of this spectrum that will be willing to listen to us if we leverage our vote, if we come into a block and leverage our vote. We need to be able to work with both sides. The problem is, the moment that you sit up and say, I'm 100% this party or that party. I'm not going to even talk about specific parties in this. Regardless of what party you choose, once you say I'm just this party, you lose your ability to work with the other party. That's what uh, partisanship is. It's saying, if it, ain't, if it ain't Democrat, I ain't doing it. If it ain't Republican, I ain't. What happens is now there's a period in time where Republicans will control the House and the Senate. But if you're totally Democrat and you don't want to work with Republicans, you can't get anything done that entire period until the power flips again. And vice versa. You've got to learn how to work with anybody who's in because you still live when a Republican president is in office. You still live when a Democratic president is in office. So you've got to be able to do that. The fact that he went to both, here's the problem. And this is what we don't we don't want to see it. See, we 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 are amazing, we're amazing at being able to see the faults of the party we don't like while simultaneously completely ignoring the faults of the party that we are uh, committed to. And the truth of the matter is we're talking government politics. There is no good side. So the thing is, we've become trained to believe anything they say and dismiss anything they say. And we miss the truth completely because it's somewhere in the middle. But here's the thing. Both parties got the invitation from Ice Cube. Donald Trump's party said, okay, we'll sit down and listen. Biden said, hey, we, we'll listen to you, but not right now. Get back to us after the election. But here's the thing. After the election, the leverage that we have to hold them to something and to cause them to step up is absolutely gone for another four years. If they get in office and, the, after, and, and we wait until after the election, there's nothing. Plus, there are going to be people who did make them stand to come to the table that are going to be demanding things from them that will be diametrically opposed to the things that are on our agenda. Why? Because there are people who benefit from our oppression. There are people who benefit financially from our demise, from our incarceration, from our lack of uh, education, from our lack of wealth, from, from, from all other elements and components of the right racial caste system that put us in a negative place people benefit from that it's not just we don't like black people it's that by oppressing black people in multitudinous different areas and aspects and uh, activities in life we benefit people are getting rich off of our poverty so there are going to be people who are going to be coming and making demands that on the surface, it's not going to say like, okay, go screw the black people, go screw. It's going to say, we want this, this, and this. But if they, if they get that, it's going to have a negative impact on the black community. Community development projects that are awarded to non-blacks in black communities. Certain funding for projects that will gentrify black communities. All of these things are going to happen over the course of the next four years. How we sit down and protect ourselves now with whoever's going to be in uh, positions of power is going to have a massive impact on how well we fare with this. This is where we failed miserably in the past is understanding political science, how things work. We don't understand military science on a social level. We don't understand um, 
of many social sciences and how we are being socially engineered into a permanent underclass position in this in, in the society we don't understand it because we don't want to read we don't want to listen we, we we literally think that we can vote ourselves out of poverty and the problem is voting is a dem democratic idea it's a democratic theory and practice here's the problem in a democratic theory and practice, the vote favors the majority. So if people are voting along the lines of their, their, their interests, and interests can be directly related and associated with certain groups based on race, religion, and sexual orientation, among other things, and people will vote along the lines of those interests from those particular groups, and your group is in a small number, 13%, makes you the second largest minority, meaning there's another minority that's actually larger than you that can actually vote their interests and have an impact on your interests. Then there's the majority that's significantly larger than you that's going to vote their interests. So in theory alone, voting cannot vote you out of uh, poverty because you don't have the numbers to do it. I'm not saying that voting doesn't have a purpose. You've got to understand, especially on the federal level, that's not your win. I'm not saying don't participate, but I'm saying if you're going to give, here's my thing, and I've said this from the beginning, and then I'm going to save a lot of this for when Dr. Uh, Blanchard and I get on, but, but I want to leave. We talk about how valuable the vote is. We talk about all the things, some of the stuff isn't true. Our people died for the right to vote. Actually, they died for freedom to vote, freedom to impact their current situation. And they placed a great value on voting because they thought erroneously that they could vote themselves out of their situation. And often we are consistently misled with that. You gotta vote. If you want something to change, you gotta, we've been voting consistently and increasingly since the early 1960s we have also increasingly voted at no less than 90 percent of, uh, of of that increase in vote voter turnout to the Democratic Party and we have simultaneously regressed in every socioeconomic category that's being measured we have actually gotten worse from a social now they have all these ways that they will give us the illusion of doing better because we like to live vicariously through uh, celebrities and black faces in high places they made us feel like we made a big progress because of Barack Obama that was Barack Obama's accomplishment it didn't change the socioeconomic reality for the average American, not in the slightest. Matter of fact, during Barack Obama's presidency, the general welfare of the black collective suffered. I'm not pointing any finger any blame. I'm telling you what the reality is. We regressed during his presidency. So him being president made us feel good, but that's as far as it went. Now, obviously, we, we love to look at, of course, there are some, I call the talented 10, that are rising and excelling uh, no matter what. But when the talented 10th doesn't understand their role in the progression of our people, we still, again, suffer. The talented 10th were, were meant to be leaders in the community. They were meant to be the, 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 the head, the thing that pulls the rest of the people along. What happened is they took our talented tent, rewarded us for doing things that were actually in opposition of the rise of our people and rewarded. Us. That's why you got so many people speaking who look like us speaking against our interests because they found them, identified them and paid them well to turn. And we don't see it. They got a bunch of people that are out there and it sounds good. They talk the talk. And they are promoting candidates that if you actually do your research and they if they've done their research, they know these candidates aren't any, aren't any good for us, but they're pushing them and they know we'll buy it because we are already sold on them uh, on, on voting Democrat. 
And so they'll buy it. Then they, they, they paint it up and, and they talk about how important this will be. And they put you out there. And again, you vote and you look up four years from now and you're no better off than you were four years ago. The wealth gap between blacks and whites isn't closing, it's widening. And wealth in this country is power. It is the wealth that is moving policy. If you think it's anything else, you're foolish. We're in a republic where we send people to represent our interests, but those people are lobbied by corporations and wealthy people and people who pick up and make phone calls and call in favors. They're not voting the interests of the people. They're voting the interests of their careers as politicians. And they're riding with the people who have the power to keep them in place. And if you don't have an economic base that wields economic power that can find and finance, or as Dr. Anderson says, if you can't buy a politician or at least rent one, you're in a, you're in a pickle. You're in a bad situation. That's the reality of it. But when you're a politician has a bunch of other people who are holding them to the flame to support and champion their interests and those particular groups interests are diametrically in opposition to yours or in diametric opposition to yours we've got to learn something so back to this cube thing then i'm shutting it down i'm not a big fan of celebrities taking this lead but at the same time, the brother's holding his course. What I can admire about him is he hasn't backed down because I've seen a bunch of people speak. And then when the pressure comes and the backlash comes, they get to apologizing. I, I, I believe that he believes in what he's doing and he's standing on it. My thing is, if he would have just went to Biden and they said he was working Biden, most of the blacks going around wouldn't have a problem, despite the fact that Biden has a 40 year record of screwing us over. You know, yeah, he was Barack Obama's president, uh, vice president. So that's all we see. We, we got these image. We love symbolism. We get caught up. We get caught up in symbolism and we don't look at the reality of what's happening. The truth of the matter is, first of all, you can say what you want to. My professional observation of this guy is that he's on a cognitive decline at a very rapid pace. Some of the things he's stating are so far off base he's throwing numbers out that are absolutely preposterous nobody's calling in the morning it's 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 amazing he uh and my thing is i'm not a champion or a advocate or a supporter of donald trump this isn't rick trying to push republican or democrat this is rick sitting up saying Stop going in on our own without knowing what's going on. Stop allowing the media to set the narrative for you. Start doing your research. If you see a story about something, validate the story before you sit. You know, we are so ready to believe the worst about one and believe the best about the other. And the truth is, both of them mean us no good at the core. The, it's not about, see, we, we, we've got to get out of this mindset about who we like and who we don't like. It's not about who we like. It's about who will do something that we ask them to do. Biden has blocked busing for black kids to be in better schools back in the 70s. He said that integration was going to be uh, uh, devastating to his family because it was going to create a racial jungle in which his children and his wife would have to live. And, oh, well, you know, I was 40 years ago. People change. And then there are all the other bills and things that he did along the way. Do your research. The crime bill of the 19, uh, 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 I believe it was 1994, that crime bill was just the culmination of a lot of legislation that this guy did. He worked with Strom Thurmond. If you don't know who that is, one of the most racist people you can ever imagine to ever go through the, 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 the annals and the halls of Congress. And he worked with him consistently. So this idea that this guy is some black savior i mean some savior for the black people isn't supported by his past kamala harris is another i've done the research i put it in a book i made the book free and available and it's balanced i talk about the good stuff that people brought up and i talk about the bad stuff 
I put it out there. I put it out there so you can actually look at her track record and see how she's handled black people. Now, what gets me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this and I'm going to leave it, is how Ice Cube is being called a sellout because he sat down with Trump. Not because he picked Trump over Biden, but Biden said not now. Or he would be actually having sat down with both of them. That was the thing. They were going to sit down with both of them. He, he wanted to sit down with both of them. And have you even read the contract to find out what he's presenting and asking for? Or are we just letting the media write the narrative? But anyway, what gets me is we're calling him a sellout, a guy who married black, stayed black, uh, still with his wife, still, you know, doing what he's doing, you know, being a father and being supportive to his children. And then we're sitting up and, and voting for and pushing the narrative of voting for a woman who doesn't acknowledge her blackness, was sworn in as the first Indian American uh, senator, uh, married a white man, ha doesn't claim blackness until it's um, profitable for, but then her, her record in California it's horrendous when it comes to dealing with black people, specifically black men. I mean, a poor person who fought the legalization of marijuana in California solely because it would cut down on the amount of people that could be incarcerated based on marijuana offenses, which meant cutting in the free labor force. This is out of her mouth, not mine. Who do you think, when we start getting into those low-level drug offenses, are going to be most affected? This is the same woman who had evidence that could have exonerated a man on death row and she held it until after he was executed. That to me is a criminal offense. It should have been punishable, but she was protected. Implied immunity. So many other things that, that, that that's there. Again, I haven't been a fan of Trump since way before anybody ever talked about him being president. I never liked him as a person. But the thing is, politics isn't about who you like. It's about who you can deal with, who you can work with, who you can get something from. When you ask a person to sit down and the person says, okay, and another person says, no, it should be held against you that the person that everybody thinks is the right person didn't sit down and now wants to marginalize what you're trying to do so that they don't have to answer for why they didn't sit down. Nobody's asking the right questions. The right question is, why wouldn't Biden at least hear? Why would you ask somebody to wait until after the election for you to show them why they should vote for you? We're going to talk about it some more, but I had to drop that on you. Uh, once again, do not forget, we need your support. There's so much work that we're trying to get done. Re research alone, the research it takes to actually put these things together, the data and the information that's shared with you on our site alone, not to mention the work and the, that we actually put into the community, uh, working with kids, working with families, uh, so much that we are trying to get done. We need your support. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day, and I will talk to you a little bit later. Don't forget, 3.30, we're logging in with Dr. Uh, Michael Blanchard. We're going to talk about a book uh, a book we, uh, book we project we just finished working on and published. Talk about a, a, an upcoming project. But we're going to also talk about this Ice Cube thing some more. We're going to talk about some more things. Uh, I love the conversations we have. We have them all the time. We just never actually publicize them. Uh, so we're going to bring it on. We're going to chop it up, and we're going to have some fun today. On that note, I'm going to get out of here. Peace. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement. For those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like 
Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the love and support that you have given uh, and sent my way and my wife's way and the organization's way. Now, I want to just take a brief moment to remind you that we still need your support. We still need your help. Go to the description box of one of our videos and see how you can support the work we're doing. Keep supporting, keep loving us, and we're going to keep loving you back. Have an awesome day. Talk Real about talk, I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements.